Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, FRP Strengthening, Strengthening Concrete Structures with Fiber Reinforced Polymers. We're excited because this is our first joint US and Canada webinar, and we'll hope that it'll be the first of many. It's also AIA certified, so if you haven't already submitted your information, please do so. Now, we have some brief housekeeping before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen and we'll answer them at the end of today's session, time permitting, or via email after. And you can always send questions to mapedigital at mapay.com. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Brian Stratman and Hamza Uzia. Brian is the Business Development Leader for Corrosion and Structural Strengthening with MAPE Corporation. Brian's work experience includes structural design of commercial and retail structures, territory sales manager for power and industrial concrete repairs and grouting, business development manager for steel piling. Fiber Reinforced Polymer, FRP, Strengthening and Corrosion Mitigation. In his current role, Brian is responsible for business development and engineering support related to MAPE's structural strengthening and corrosion product lines. As a PE, he has over a decade of experience related to the design and installation of FRP strengthening systems for concrete and masonry structures, and is also a NACE certified cathodic protection technician, CP2. Brian's also an active member of the ACI 440 Strengthening Committee and ICRI Strengthening and Corrosion Committees. Hamza Uzia is a sales engineer for MAPE Canada. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering from Polytechnic School of Montreal. He provides support to engineers, architects, and owners for the specification and field support of MAPE products and systems related to concrete, structural strengthening, repairs, injection solutions, industrial flooring, waterproofing, and underground construction. As a certified MAPE Technical Institute, MTI, instructor, he provides theoretical and practical training to engineers, architects, and installers. Homs is also a member of Construction Specifications Canada, the American Concrete Institute Quebec, and East Ontario Chapter, and the International Concrete Repair Institute, for whom he received 2019's 40 Under 40 Award. Brian, Hamsa, the floor is yours. Okay, well, good afternoon, good morning, uh, I guess wherever you're uh, might find yourself, but I hope everyone's doing well today. Uh, we'll uh, jump right into this here. Um, so let's see, why is this not, there we go. Okay, all right, so um, we're going to be talking about uh, FRP uh, systems today, uh, fiber reinforced polymers. Um, we have really four kind of main objectives. Um, the first would just be to a basic understanding of what these materials are, uh, their structural behavior, uh, as far as you know how they interact with the concrete, uh, et cetera. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, you know the various applications that FRP systems are appropriate for uh, as it pertains to concrete. Um, we'll, we'll only be talking about concrete today. We're not really going to get into masonry too much. Um, it's mostly just concrete that we're talking about, but you can use these for masonry as well and, and some timber applications also. Um, but today we're just going to be talking about concrete. Um, and we'll uh, learn where it's appropriate to, to use these systems. Um, you know, as be you know, flexural strengthening of beams, walls, et cetera. We'll kind of go through the different different applications. And then Hamza will come on and, and walk you through the some of the installation issues, uh, quality control, uh, things like that. So with that, I will jump right into it. So uh, really when we're talking about FRP, we're, we're talking about strengthening typically. Um, you know, sometimes we use it for protection, but mainly we're talking about uh, strengthening of existing structures. So there's really four kind of main reasons why we would be looking to strengthen a structure. The first is simply looking to increase the load bearing capacity of that structure. So that could be due to a 
a change in use. So maybe you have a, you know, an old warehouse that's being turned into apartments and you need to increase the live load uh, ratings for the floor. Um, uh, it could be, you know, maybe you have an existing office building and they want to, you know, put a, you know, maybe it's a law, law office and they want to put a library of books. So then you have that big heavy load that you need to account for. So you might have those new load conditions. And then, of course, you could have designer construction errors. So either, you know, the engineer possibly, you know, under designed, um, which certainly happens from time to time, um, or there was a construction error. The bars were supposed to be at, you know, say, you know, 12 inches on center, 20, you know, 25 centimeters on center. Uh, and they got put at, at, say, you know, 16 or 18 inches on centers, or, you know, just 10 centimeters on center as opposed to the, the tw uh, 12 or 25 that we were looking for. So, obviously, you have to come back in after the fact and, and fix that. So, that's one of the one of the big reasons that we get involved with, with FRP. And then the second one there, it's certainly the biggest, um, we say damage or deterioration, really... That covers a lot of different things, but mainly we're talking about corrosion. Um, obviously, corrosion is detrimental to the strength of the reinforcing steel as it corrodes and loses section and area of the steel. You lose some of that flexural capacity or shear capacity, what, whatever application you're dealing with. So we need to get in and, and replace that strength that's been lost. So um, certainly, probably one of the more common reasons what we'd be using FRP. Um, but then beyond just corrosion, you could have cut or damaged reinforcing steel. So, you know, oftentimes if they're, you know, maybe a new tenant's moving in, they, they want to cut some, some new holes in the walls or the, the slabs for, you know, HVAC systems or running electrical wiring, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, they'll cut through the wall or the slab, the beam, whatever it may be, and they'll damage that reinforcing steel while they do it. So you got to come back in and replace that, that damaged steel. Impact damage, this is generally trucks driving down the highway uh, and they hit the bridge. Um, happens a lot more than you probably would realize, um, but, you know, either they have a load that's too high or, you know, it's a low low clearance bridge and they weren't paying attention. They just are driving along and they clip the bridge. Um, and if there's damage, then you obviously would need to get back in and fix that. Um, and then you could have fire. Uh, earthquakes are certainly a big one. FRP is great for seismic strengthening. Um, which kind of gets into that third bullet point, um, so that increasing seismic performance of a structure. That's, that's where FRP was first used. Uh, actually, in Japan was the first commercial use of FRP, and it was to increase the uh, confinement of their columns after a big earthquake exposed the fact that, that many of their columns were under design for the size of earthquakes that they would be getting. So um, the last one there, blast resistance, really doesn't come up super often uh, but it's you know it's obviously a very specialized kind of engineering application but frp materials are very effective uh, to increase the blast resistance of structures um, and certainly can be used uh, if you have a, an application that would re require it traditionally uh, when we strengthen structures um, there's, there's certainly many different ways but some of the more common ones um, bonded steel plates uh, where you, you either just use epoxy to bond the plate or uh, you can see in this picture on the lower left there, they, they bolted it into the, to the slab. Um, then there's external post tensioning that you see there on the right, um, where they actually put external PT cables after the fact. Um, the issue with kind of some of these more traditional strengthening techniques is, is one, they're very heavy um, if you're talking about steel plates. So you need a lot of big heavy equipment to get them installed. Um, but the bigger issue is really that you're you're almost always having to penetrate the concrete either to put the anchor bolts in or um, you know just to fasten it in place. There's, there's different reasons, but anytime that you have to start you know penetrating or drilling into the concrete, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to damage the existing reinforcing steel, uh, which of course is just going to compound whatever problem you're already trying to fix. So. If we can avoid that, then that would certainly be advantageous to, to do so. Um, with concrete, another real common uh, way to do it is just simple suction enlargement. But again, I mean, you can see here they've, they're making, you know, dozens and dozens of penetrations. Um, you're also losing, you know, if you're in a parking garage, generally speaking, you don't have, you know, even, even an inch or two of overhead space to spare. Uh, so if you have to lower the beam, you know, by enlarging it down, that's just simply not possible oftentimes. 
or even in a, you know in, a, in an office building or somewhere it may be possible but in general the architects are, are not trying to give up much of their floor space so they can avoid it so it's, it's not necessarily the the most uh desirable uh outcome that, that you might be looking for now with with frp systems you really solve really all of these issues i mean it's very very low profile uh generally the installed thickness is going to be less than about a 16th of an inch which is i don't know a, a thousandth of a centimeter or something very very thin very 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 thin um easily concealed with uh top coat so the picture we're looking at here is a kind of a before and after um so you know you can hide it um i'm, I'm not going to lie to you if you were to go and this is actually the alabama uh crimson tide football stadium uh, so if you were to go to an Alabama football game and find this column and walk right up to it, you're going to see the fibers through the coating, uh, you know, if you're if you're looking for them. But if you're just kind of walking by casually, you're not really paying much attention, you're not going to notice at all. Uh, so it's very, very concealable to the general public. Um, minimal equipment. Um, everything you need really can can be held in your hand. Um, you know, the surface prep equipment would be the largest. If you're doing, obviously, sandblasting or something like that, you're going to have some larger machinery. Uh, but oftentimes they're just using angle grinders and such, and, and Hamza will touch on that later. Um, so really, no no big heavy machinery required. Um, a man lift, um, you know, if you have obviously if you need to get elevated, but um, the actual tools themselves are are all will fit in a small tool bag. So it's really really convenient from that perspective. And then the, the big item, it doesn't add, you know, because this material is I mean, it's not weight less, but it's very, very, very light. So you're really, you're really not adding any kind of appreciable dead load to the structure. So if we were to have done section enlargement with this column and we're on a, a supported floor, um, now you've got to look, okay, well, I'm adding, you know, an extra, say, six inches or, you know, 30, 30 millimeters, whatever it may be, of concrete around that column. Is, is all that extra weight going to affect the ability of the slab or the beam that's supporting the column from below, you know, is it able to carry that additional weight? You know, if it's just one column, probably yes, but if we're, if we're talking about doing this on, you know, a whole, a whole parking structure, for example, all that cumulative weight really starts to add up and then, you know, perhaps your foundations might not be able to carry that load. Uh, so with FRP, you just eliminate all of those uh, potential issues. Um, so I keep saying FRP. Uh, FRP stands for fiber reinforced polymers. Um, so what that is in, in the basic sense is you have some type of a fiber and then that those fibers are encapsulated in some sort of a polymer. Um, in our case, this is an epoxy. Uh, the picture on the right that we're looking at uh, is a, a magnified view of an FRP sheet. Um, little round uh, kind of sp spherical looking uh, things you see in the picture there are the actual individual fibers. Um, so those get bundled up. Um, if you've ever seen an actual sheet of FRP, there's little bundles of fibers and then those get woven together. So what we're looking at here is one individual fiber of that bundle. Um, it's about 1 20th the size of a human hair uh, as far as the diameter of it. So it's very, 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 very small. Uh, but as you'll see here shortly, it's very, very, very strong at the same time. Uh, the types of fibers that you'll see used in the strengthening market uh, for concrete, um, carbon is going to be used probably 80, 90% of the time. Uh, really, anytime you have a, a true strengthening application uh, where it's under sustained load, you're going to want to use carbon. I'll, I'll get in, into that a little more here in a second. But um, the glass fibers are generally more applicable to uh, something like a seismic event or um, just simple, you know, protection, like, you know, kind of a lot of the DOTs will just wrap columns. Um, if they're out doing work on other parts of a bridge, they'll just wrap the columns just to kind of give it some like kind of belt and suspenders protection. So you're not really loading it per se. It's just it's just kind of there to hold everything in place. Um, so, so we'll talk more about why uh, why that is here in the next couple of slides, but um, just keep that in mind. And then the, the last one there, Aramid, uh, mostly probably more familiar with Kevlar um, from you know, bulletproof vests. Um, there are some manufacturers that sell Aramid fibers. Uh, we're not one of them. Um, this material is incredibly tough. I mean, it's it's there's a reason it's used for bulletproof vests. I mean, just cutting a sheet. Uh, that's you know 40 centimeters wide or you know say you know 16 inches wide 
I mean, you're going to spend a good five minutes just trying to cut, you know, with a pair of scissors to cut through it because it's just so tough, uh, the fibers. But really, you'd only use it for like a blast application, um, just general flexural or shear strengthening. You wouldn't want to mess with the Kevlar. Uh, one, it's very, very expensive. And then two, it's just it's not very user friendly. Um, however, if you're doing, you know, like a really high, high, you know, large blast uh, strengthening project. I mean, it certainly uh, would be something worth looking into. Um, so you know, I mentioned we'll get into you know the kind of the benefits of the carbon, and so that's what we're going to do now. Um, the carbon is very, very high strength and very high stiffness, much more so than the glass, um, which is also very strong, but just not quite as strong as the carbon. Um, and it has excellent durability and endurance characteristics. So when we put it through, you know, cyclic load testing, when we you know do uh, environmental exposures to chlorides and things like that, carbon really holds up much, much better than glass. Um, and also it's not very susceptible to creep, uh, whereas glass is very, very susceptible to creep. So because of that, if we're doing a, a flexural strengthening, shear strengthening, you know, any type of load where it's gonna be constantly loading the FRP, you're gonna to wanna to use carbon for that. With the one exception of the material is technically a metal it's not a metal but it is uh, on the periodic table it, it certainly exhibits properties of a metal and because of that it is conductive um so if you were in a um you know say a mechanical room and you have a concern with sparks or something like that there certainly is a fire hazard with carbon and then also um the, the big thing to pay attention to is it because it is conductive um it in the con if you put carbon directly in contact with steel, it's actually gonna make the steel corrode because of dissimilar metals and uh, the lower nobility of the carbon versus um, the steel makes the steel corrode just being in contact uh, with a different metal. So um, we, we do different things to insulate and make sure that contact doesn't happen, but it's something certainly to pay attention to um, if you are gonna have any contact. Uh, you know, this this happens a lot if you, you know, they're they're having to you know, hang a, a steel plate for some reason, you know, after maybe there was a, a, a drop tile ceiling or something and they have to install the um, little hanger rods for the ceiling or, um, you know, a plate on a beam, any number of different reasons. But if, if you do have metal in contact with the carbon, that's something we need to be aware of so we can address. And it's, it is very easily addressed. Uh, you can insulate it with the epoxy. Um, it's just something that you do have to pay attention to. Uh, for the glass, again, it's also very, very high strength, um, especially, you know, for its weight. Um, but, you know, not it's about half as strong as the carbon. Uh, but the big thing with the glass is it's non-conductive, so we can use it as an insulating layer um, in those situations that I just described um, if we need to. Um, it gets used primarily for uh, single events like a seismic, uh, you know, a seismic event, an earthquake. Um, where it's just going to take the load and then after the event you can go and inspect it see if, if it's damaged at all if it needs to be repaired uh, before it gets another earthquake um, the reason for that is glass is susceptible to creep rupture so as it's as it's placed under constant load it really starts to stretch uh, and ultimately will rupture uh, much more rapidly and prematurely than you would see from the carbon um, so it's just really not ideal. It doesn't have that, that durability and endurance that the carbon has. Uh, so we try to avoid it uh, for, you know, flexural or shear strengthening where it's just under constant load. Um, the difference, or the exception, I guess, would uh, the exception to that kind of rule would be for uh, masonry, which we're really not talking much about today. But because masonry is much lower strength than the carbon, sometimes putting carbon, it's, it's actually too much stiffness for a, a masonry wall. Uh, so you would go and go you know, and use the glass in that situation just because it's um, you know it's it, it, uh, it doesn't it provides more a closer amount of capacity to what's already there. Um, you just have to apply a more severe uh, durability uh, reduction factors to it that uh, both the CSA uh, S806 code and the ACI 440 code both address that uh, when you're when you're designing. Uh, for the polymers um, that we're using to encapsulate these fibers, there's literally thousands of different polymers, but all, all the FRP manufacturers are using epoxy. 
Uh, we use epoxy because it's it's got very similar properties to the concrete uh, as far as the stiffness and the, the uh, flexural capacities and things like that. It, it just lines up the best. Um, it also adheres exceptionally well to the concrete. Of course, the one downside to that is epoxy has absolutely horrible fire endurance. So you're going to lose the FRP system when it's exposed to a fire. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit uh, later on here. Uh, so just kind of comparing uh, some of the different products. So I put um, some of the more traditional weights of fabric that you'll see. All, all the FRP products on the market are, are designated by a weight. Uh, the two most common that you'll run into are 9 ounce or an 18 ounce carbon, which is 300 grams a square meter or 600 grams per square meter. More recently, we've seen um, some, some heavier fabrics coming out. We have one as well. Um, these are, I've got a typo there, I apologize. It should be 1,200 uh, grams per square meter on the third column uh, and 36 ounces per square yard. Um, so essentially that's four layers of the, the lightest one on the left hand, but it's all combined into one layer. Um, so you, you will see those used here and there, but you really can't double up the layers too much. You're probably limited to, you know, one at best two layers of that really heavy weight. Uh, you know, the 36 ounce or the, you know, 1,200 grams per square meter. The glass typically weighs around 900 grams a square meter to 27 ounces per yard, square yard. Um, but you can see kind of the design, st design thicknesses, excuse me, are, are very, very, very low profile, very thin, you know, 200 of an inch. This is the cured thickness with the epoxy. Um, so, you know, half a millimeter, a millimeter, two millimeters, you know, we're, we're not talking much thickness at all. But when you look at those strengths that we're seeing, the tensile strength, uh, you know, around 1,500 megapascals, around two, you know, 210 or so kips per square inch uh, for most of the carbons. And in the glass, you know, again, is much, much, much less strong, uh, less strength than, than the carbon, but still pretty good, you know, considering it's only 0.07 or two millimeters, two millimeters thick. Um, the stiffness is really the, the governing property However, the tensile strengths, everybody reports the tensile strength. It's, it's part of the 3039, ASTM 3039 reporting requirements, but uh, the tensile strength is really irrelevant uh, when we're designing all of the design codes, be it the ACI or the CSA design guidelines. Um, everything's based off of stiffness, and we'll, we'll see why that is uh, a, f a little bit later here. Um, but the stiffness is very, very good, obviously, for all for all the products. Um, and you can see those rupture strains down there too, as well, um, which have a big part in the design of these systems. Uh, just you know, don't want to spend a lot of time here. Just the, the one thing to point out: this is obviously a stress strain diagram. Um, the, the important takeaway from this is that these materials are linear elastic uh, right up until failure. So it's not like steel where you've got your yield point. And it kind of tops out and then starts yielding and then alt and then it starts reducing a little bit until you get to your your failure point with frp materials they're just going to keep taking load taking load and taking load and then all of a sudden you're going to get a sudden sudden failure of it as far as uh tensile strength now we never are able to achieve the ultimate tensile strength of the material um and i'll explain why that is uh, here in a few slides um but just that's why the, the ultimate tensile strength is really not all that important because we just will we'll never get there. It's going to delaminate before that happens. So uh, it's just uh, you know just to point out the difference between steel and, and FRP is that it, it is linear elastic all the way up until its failure point. So um, there's three different types of FRP systems: um, fabric pre-cured uh, pre laminates and then FRP bars. Um, so the fabric is what we're just looking at on the, the picture on the top right there. Um, you can see it comes in a roll. Um, these are flexible sheets of either carbon or glass or the aramid fibers, the Kevlar as well. Uh, then they come in uh, uniaxial or bi-directional. Um, there's also a quadriaxial fabric that we carry. Uh, I don't think we really sell it here in North America, but uh, over in Europe, they use a lot of these uh, quadriaxial materials for some of these really old, you know, 14th century uh, churches and castles, things like that, that, um, you know, they're just trying to do what they can. Um, but when we say uniaxial, the fibers run the length of the sheet. So there's that ruler on the picture in the top, uh, top right, 
um, the fibers are running parallel with that ruler. So it just runs along the length of the sheet. With the biaxial, bidirectional fabrics, um, they'll either be running at plus or minus 45 degrees. So they, you know, be at an angle or some of them are zero, 90. Um, it really just depends on the manu manufacturer. They'll, they'll specify whether it's a, a zero or 90 or, or plus or minus 45 degree fabric. Uh, but the, the the actual fabric uh, FRP products are used, well, they can be used for any any strengthening scenario that you run into, but they're particularly beneficial for, uh, you know, column wraps or shear you know, U wraps around the beam. Anytime you have to turn a, a corner or, bend, you know, make a 90 degree bend with the material, you're going to have to use the fabric because the, the pre-cured laminates, the plates, um, while they come in a roll, like you see there in the middle picture, um, they're not going to hold a 90 degree corner uh, and, and stay bonded. That would be impossible. It's, it's just a, there's no way. Um, so we would only be able to use the plates on a, on a flat application. So, so think um, slabs, uh, flexural strengthening of a beam, uh, certainly walls, shear walls. Um, it's great for CMU applications because it's it's a lot easier to deal with the, the coursing joints between the, uh, each brick uh, as opposed to with the fabric. You'd have to try and work it into that, you know, to the joint uh, all the time. It's just be a nightmare to try and install that. So uh, the, the laminate plates are great for the CMU walls and really any flat, you know, flat application that you may have. It's just a lot quicker and easier to install as uh, Hamza will describe later. Um, and then there's the FRP bars. Uh, these are carbon or glass typically. Um, we'll uh, apply these by cutting a, a shallow groove into the concrete and uh, what we call near surface mounted application. Um, where you, you know, imagine if you have a, a, say a parking garage and you got a negative moment issue right in the drive lane, well, we can't put a, a plate or a, a strip of fabric on the top of the concrete where cars are gonna be driving over it. Obviously that's gonna damage the system. So with the bar, you can actually cut a small groove into the concrete and kind of internally reinforce the concrete. So you're you're protecting the FRP from pedestrian or vehicular traffic. Uh, so now we'll get into some of the, uh, the design stuff. Um, first thing you need to do if you're looking at uh, using FRP is to check the strengthening limits. Um, I mentioned the fire issues with FRP. Uh, because you can't fireproof FRP materials, you have to make sure there's a, a baseline capacity that you can meet. Um, so in the 440, the CSA doesn't have a direct equivalent equation to this, but in the next slide, uh, they do have a statement that, uh, that for fire applications, that's so basically the same thing. Uh, but it's basically essentially saying that this, the existing structure without any strengthening has to be able to carry the service loads um, on its own. Uh, and then if it meets that, but it simply can't meet the 1.2 and the 1.6 uh, you know, safety factor loads, ultimate loads, then uh, you, well, that's what we're using the FRP for, is to get you from the, from the service load up to the ultimate loads. Um, if you can't provide service loads with the existing structure and you're going to be relying on whatever system you use to strengthen, you actually cannot use FRP. Um, and that is particularly true in fire situations. So when you're dealing with fire, there's actually a separate equation in 440 where it's just 100% of the service load. Um, if you don't have fire issues, they, they give you a little more flexibility. But in the, if you have a fire rating uh, that needs to be maintained, then this is the equation that you need to, to adhere to. In the CSA, they, they don't have an equation, but it has the statement that you can read their original assembly must be capable of supporting the full specified gravity load. So Again, it's basically saying the same thing. If, if it can't carry the loads, if you're in a, a collapse situation with a, before you put the FRP on, you should not be using FRP because there's no way to, to fire protect FRP. Um, you can maintain fire ratings and use FRP, but you can't actually fire protect the FRP. It's gonna burn and be lost, generally in about 10 to 15 minutes in, in the event of a fire. So um, both, both the CSA and the ACI guidelines address that and prevent you from using FRP in situations where it would be required as a primary uh, load carrying uh, member. Uh, 
So we'll go through now some of the applications um, and kind of some of the engineering associated with that. So if you imagine a beam or a slab, we can do a flexural strengthening for a positive bending on the underside. Uh, so as you imagine, we've got just a gravity load. This could be a beam, a slab, whatever, it's gonna bend. Um, so we're just putting the material on the bottom side. That's very important. The material always has to be placed on the tensile face of the concrete. It can't be placed on the top in this situation because that's the uh, area of the beam or slab that would be in compression. Um, with uh, FRP materials, they're only able to assist in tension. They don't provide any compressive capacity with the exception of a column, which is obviously different because you're putting the material in the tension. But in this case, um, you'd be actually compressing the fabric. And if you just take a piece of paper and crumple it up, obviously there's no resistance when you do that, FRP is exactly the same. So the material always has to go in the tensile face uh, of whatever member you're strengthening. So when we do negative moment strengthening over the supports uh, in, this, in this example, uh, then the material does have to go on the top because that's our tensile face. So um, with the cantilevered member, the material would need to be on the top, obviously. Uh, whatever the tensile face, uh, tensile zone of the member you're strengthening is, that's where the material needs to be placed. Um, in, a, in a situation like a moment reversal, like if you had a blast down below um, or I've run into projects where you had a cantilevered slab that was deflecting, so they decided to shore it up permanently with a column and then turn it into a simply supported member, well now you're reversing. Um, so again, you have to always make sure that you, you get that material placed on the tensile face of the concrete. Um, question comes up a lot, the contractors especially, uh, if, if they're on a job site and there's, you know, that you specified that it goes on the underside because that's where it needs to be, uh, but they see all the, you know, the HVAC uh, pipes and, and ducts and, and everything else, and they think to themselves, geez, it would be a lot simpler if I could just put this on the top, so they'll ask the question. Um, unfortunately, the answer is no, um, they have to get around those obstructions because uh, the material is not going to provide any benefit when you place it in, in the compression zone. Uh, works the same way for, for walls as well. Um, again, tensile face. Um, so if you've got bending of a wall, this is a simply supported wall, so it's gonna go on the opposite face of the loading. Um, if you have a retaining wall um, with you know maybe a soil load on the one side, um, then you do have to put it on the face where the bending is expected to occur. So if, you have a retaining wall situation, yes, that does involve uh, having to dig out around the wall and place the FRP and then, and then backfill afterwards. So again, very, very important that we know where the, the, the tensile face is, uh, where, where that will be, and that's where the material has to go. Um, so just kind of, kind of some general rules of thumb as it pertains to the flexural strengthening. Uh, we can do it for really any type of concrete, uh, lightweight concrete, traditionally reinforced concrete, post-tension concrete, pre-stressed. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, if it's concrete, we can strengthen it. Um, there are some differences in how we approach the actual design of the FRP uh, when we're looking at, say, a post-tension system versus just traditionally reinforced. Um, there's some different design equations in the in the CSA and ACI guidelines, um, but you can still you can still do it. Um, if you get into any kind of moment redistribution, um, I know ACI allows that. I, I would assume CSA also does. I'm not super familiar with with CSA's building codes, uh, but I would presume they also allow that. Um, there are some limitations uh, on moment redistribution uh, when you're using FRP. Um, it used to state that the effects of FRP weren't known, just proceed with caution, uh, which was kind of a, a waste, you know, I mean, it, didn't, it kind, of, kind of flagged it, but said we can't help you with, with how to handle it. Uh, fortunately, they've changed that now, at least in the ACI 440 document, and they, they give you specific equations on how to reduce the amount of moment redistribution that you can take advantage of when you do use FRP. So it's certainly something to pay attention to. Um, if you're if you are doing some FRP strengthening, but also using uh, moment redistribution to try and uh, reduce the amount of strengthening that you need, you do need to pay attention to uh, how that allowable moment redistribution gets reduced uh, by using FRP. The third point there, um, this question comes up a lot, uh, and and that's that 
the material just does not effectively reduce deflection. So, you know, a lot we'll get a call, an engineer will call and say, hey, I got this this beam, it's deflecting, you know, four inches, which is obviously pretty excessive. I mean, we wanted to get it to, to two to two inches. Um, can we shore it up, put the FRP on, and then pull the shoring and then and then stop that four inch deflection? Unfortunately, no. Um, if it was deflecting four inches before, it's going to probably deflect, you know, three point eight or three point nine inches. So it really does not affect um, deflection at all. Um, and the reason for that, it's just not stiff, not nearly stiff enough to um, actually reduce deflections. You'd have to you know, do a, a steel plate or something that's much, much, much more stiff than the FRP. Uh, as far as a rule of thumb, if you're kind of looking at a project and you, know, you got to do some strengthening, uh, you know, and you want to just kind of get a rough idea, well, is FRP possible? The first thing you'd have to do is check those equations that I, I showed previously to make sure that you can carry the service load uh, without the FRP. Assuming that you can, um, we can generally increase the FRP, or um, I'm sorry, increase the strength of the existing member by about 70% in uh, bending capacity. Um, it's not a hard number, it might be a little bit less, sometimes it's a little bit more, uh, but it's kind of a general rule of thumb, at, at, you know, 70% is kind of our, our ceiling. Um, so if, if you're looking at a beam and you're trying to triple the, the bending capacity, we could tell you right off the bat, there's just no way that FRP is going to be able to get you there. Um, if it's 65 or 75 percent, then yeah, we, we you know, it's going to probably take a lot of material, but we, we can probably most likely do it. Um, so it's just kind of a general rule to help you along, uh, you know, as a, on a preliminary basis to see if FRP might, might be a possibility. Um, Real quick here, um, the only thing I want to point out here, um, if you look at this equation on the bottom, um, you just if you were to just look at the left, the left hand side, the A sub S, F sub S, and then uh, the neutral axis location, if you're designing concrete, that's the equation you use. You get the area of the reinforcing steel times the stress of the reinforcing steel times the neutral neutral axis location gives you the bending bending capacity of that member. FRP is really designed in the exact same way, uh, except we have the area of the FRP as opposed to the area of the steel. Then we have the effective stress in the FRP as opposed to the stress of the steel. And then we have the neutral axis location of the FRP as opposed to the neutral axis location of the steel. So it's really no different than, than what you're used to doing. Um, it's just different materials and different material properties. Um, now, as far as where, you know, that 70%, why is there a limit? Why can't we just continue to put more material on and get more strength? Um, the reason is, and I mentioned this before, is that we can't ever get to the ultimate, uh, ultimate strain or stress of the material. It's going to de delaminate at some point prior to that. So the way that the, the guidelines handle this is they've come up with this debonding strain or effective strain uh, that gets calculated based on these equations here. Um, they're, they're the same in CSA and uh, ACI. Um, the only difference is uh, for, for the metric units or for the uh, US customary units. Um, but you can see here, um, it really depends on the strength of the concrete, uh, F, uh, F prime C, the compressive, uh, compressive strength of the concrete. And then on the bottom, you've got N is the number of layers of material, then the stiffness times the thickness of the material. So as we increase the number of layers, this allowable strain starts to converge on zero. Um, generally, with you know, with your standard uh, 600 grams per square meter, that's the 18 ounce per square yard material. Um, around three or four layers, you start to get to that zero strain. Um, so adding five, six, seven layers, well, it's going to add a very, very small amount of additional capacity. It's it's really negligible. Um, so it doesn't make sense to spend that money and just keep dumping you know, adding more and more layers to get essentially no return. Um, so that's where that upper limit comes from. Um, and that's that's to prevent the material from delaminating uh, due to overstress. So um, that's that's where that upper bound comes from as far as, you know, three, four layers or the 70% uh, kind of max for flexural capacity. Uh, for shear strengthening, um, there's either in-plane or out-of-plane shear strengthening. The uh, material can be used for both. Um, which uh, which direction you run it obviously is going to depend a little bit on, on which what's the direction of the shear being placed on the wall. Um, there's different requirements um, as far as the thickness of the walls. I think it's like four 
four inch walls and six inch wide walls. Um, you can get away with putting the material on just one side of the wall. If it's eight inches or wider, um, then you have to actually put the material on both sides of the wall. So there's uh, that all comes straight from the, the ACI guidelines. That I'm sure probably there's a similar requirement in the CSA as well, um, as far as which, which sides you need to place it on. Um, but generally anything eight inches or wider you're going to need, um, which I believe is 200 millimeters, uh, you need uh, material on both sides. Uh, if you have any overturning going on, if you need like force transfer into the, uh, to the slabs to help tie everything together, uh, you can do that with a uh, steel angle bonded to the FRP, um, and then you would anchor that uh, angle down into the concrete. Um, this would be a great example when I was talking earlier about um, the conductivity of the carbon and having to pay attention to that. This is a, a prime example of that. So in this case, we would want to either put uh, a piece of fiberglass in between the carbon and the steel angle or just make sure that we put in a, a lot of extra epoxy uh, to make sure that there's no contact between that carbon and that steel so we don't get a corrosion cell um, starting and then corroding the steel plate that, you, that you're relying on. So... Um, good example of that. Um, shear strengthening of beams. Um, typically, we use what we call a U-wrap because it's uh, shaped just like a U, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can also do just on the sides, um, or you can wrap all the way around. Uh, there's varying effects. If you can wrap all the way around the member, um, you get the biggest return, uh, the, the, most, uh, the largest increase in capacity. Um, but obviously you can't often do that because there's uh, a slab or something, uh, you know, we generally don't just build beams for the look of the beam. Sometimes the architects do that, but, um, you know, not very often. Uh, so usually you can't wrap all the way around it. So that's why we do the U wrap. Uh, but then there's instances where maybe there's a, a steel plate that's been already installed on the bottom, or you've got obstructions of some kind and you just can't wrap underneath and around. Um, so in that case, you actually can just put the material on the sides only, uh, but you do get a further reduction in the capacity provided when you do that. Um, but it is a possibility. Um, so if, if you have an obstruction, you know, don't just say, oh, I can't use FRP because I can't get a U-wrap. Um, that's not the case. It's just you get a reduction in capacity uh, provided by the FRP. Um, so... Again, similar to uh, flexural, I mean, any type of concrete is fine. Um, beams, walls, shear diaphragms, if you're in a seismic region, um, FRP is great for that. There are some uh, really good guidelines in both the CSA and the ACI for uh, seismic applications. Um, you can uh, expect generally about two kips per inch of beam depth or wall depth uh, as far as how much capacity you can get, uh, which is three and a half kilonewtons per millimeter for uh, our Canadian friends. Um, so a 30 inch deep beam, you can figure, uh, you know, about 60 kips of shear capacity that you'd be able to get is just kind of, again, that's a, it's not a hard fixed number, but it's just a, a rough approximation. If you're kind of on the preliminary stages of a project and just trying to explore your different options, um, you know, if, if it's 30 inches deep and you're trying to add 200 kips, there's just, you know, again, because of that delamination equation, the delamination strain, um, there's just no way we could get there. Um, and then lastly, um, FRP systems are not effective for punching shear. So if you have a punching shear issue, uh, anyone that's not familiar with that, it's if you have a, a column being supported on a slab, a supported slab, um, the column, because of that concentrated load, it wants to punch through uh, the, the slab. Um, so if, you know, they will put uh, a thick, what we call a drop panel or a thickened area of the slab underneath where the column is. Um, but, you know, if it's an older building and they, you know, they didn't really understand the, the uh, principles as much when it was built, there might not be a drop panel. Um, so you might have punching shear where, where the column is punching through. Unfortunately, FRP is not effective uh, as a solution to that. Uh, then the third uh, kind of main uh, application we'll see is just column confinement. Um, so that's just wrapping uh, around the column um, like we see here. Um, so really you get a, a marginal increase in axial capacity of that column, uh, but you really get significant gains in ductility of the column, which is why it's, it's so great for, for seismic strengthening. Um, 
the the equations uh, from both the CSA and the ACI are, are very similar, just a little bit different factors uh, for for the CSA versus the ACI. Uh, but the the way you do it is you calculate a confining pressure that the FRP provides by wrapping around it, uh, and then uh, you use that pressure to calculate the additional compressive strength that you're providing. Now, it's not much, uh, you know, on a on a round column you're going to get somewhere probably around like 100 psi 50 anywhere from 50 to 100 psi of additional capacity per layer um, which is not much um, you know uh, so if you're if you've got a column with you know you're looking to get like a, on you know additional if you're tripling or something you're adding a ton of weight you're probably not going to get there with frp um, the difference with columns versus flexural or shear it, it is not what we call bond critical um, so there is no delamination concerns. So you can actually use 100 or 200 layers of FRP. Um, so in theory, you could get any load you wanted to, but it's going to be way too expensive um, when you start talking about that that many numbers of layers. So um, you know, it's really not. While you can get a, you know some increase, it's it's not the best way of adding uh, compressive capacity to the column. There's there's certainly other ways that'll get you more. Um, it's really that ductility enhancement that we get out of, of the FRP. Uh, and, and then another thing a lot of the DOTs are doing, as I mentioned before, is they're just wrapping. If you got a lot of, you know, up, up in the north where we're dropping snow, uh, salt everywhere for the snow and the ice, um, you get a lot of just deteriorated columns from the plows going by and blasting them with all the snow and the salt. Um, so you get a lot of spalling and cracking. The, the DOTs are using it just as a, a layer. They'll throw a layer or two of glass around the column just not really for any load carrying capacity, just, just as a, a help hold it together and maybe extend the service life of the column out a little bit longer. Um, here's a, a, you know, in practice view of that. Um, this is a double column. So you can see there's, there's a column and then another column immediately adjacent to it. There's probably only, I don't know, maybe an inch or two in between those columns, which would be about uh, 50, 50 millimeters or so um between which is really all the room you need uh to be able to actually install the frp if you can fit a paint roller in the space you've got enough room to install a system so really really versatile material as far as the inst installation side that Hans is going to get to here in a second um you can do confinement for square columns obviously we're, we're sh uh, showing one here um there are limits to that uh is, I'm not sure what the CSA is probably similar, uh, but in the ACI, the, the limit is uh, the side aspect ratio has to be less than two, uh, which means you no know, no one side can be more than two times larger than the other side. So if you had a say a 36 inch by 12 inch column, you can't you can't confine that with FRP. You'd be limited to a 24 by 12, or uh, if it was 36, the other one would have to be 18 inches. Uh, you know, pretty pretty simple math. Um, and then no face can be larger than 36 inches. So if it's a you know a four by four by four foot square column, that's actually too large um, to wrap uh, or to confine with FRP. You're limited to a three foot. Now with a round uh, like pipe or a really large column, it can be as large as you want. I mean we've we've wrapped tanks that are probably uh, 200 feet in diameter. Um, but this is just the limitations only apply to square or rectangular columns. Uh, then we've just got slab openings. I talked about this at the beginning, where you know maybe you're cutting a hole in the slab, you cut some steel. We're just we're just replacing that cut steel with the FRP. Uh, it also helps uh, control cracking um, at the corners there. Um, so oftentimes, even though the bars are just running in one direction here, we would actually run material uh, uh, perpendicular to the bars also, just to help control cracking at that reentrant corner. Uh, it's certainly a good idea to do that. Uh, but again, the material needs to be placed on whichever uh, side uh, the bar was. So I showed top bars here. Um, so if we cut a top bar, we need to replace the material on the top of the slab. If it was a bottom bar, uh, we'd want to replace that, uh, place the material on the bottom of the slab or, or the beam, whatever it may be. All right, so I will hand it off to Hamza then. He's going to take you through the installation. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Always a pleasure to hear you sharing your knowledge about FRP. 
So my part of the presentation consists of detailing and illustrating key steps of uh, FRP systems installation. We will see together for probably 10 to 12 minutes, uh, preliminary steps prior to application, surface preparation requirement, application of products of each system and some quality control hints. So before installing the selected FRP system, all unsound concrete must be removed and repaired per uh, ICRI guidelines using appropriate concrete repair material and methods. If there was corroded steel rebars, it is highly suggested to expose them, clean them and protect them against uh, future corrosion using appropriate solutions such as uh, galvanic anodes or uh, corrosion inhibiting coatings like the one, uh, the blue one we see in the middle picture. Once repair material is applied, adequate time must be provided for the repair to fully cure. Next slide, please. The existing concrete uh, must achieve a minimum concrete surface profile of CSP3 per ICRI. The CSP3 actually will ensure that the pore structure uh, of the existing substrate is sufficiently open to ensure adhesive bond between the substrate and the FRP system. Uh, which is uh, essential for bond critical applications such as uh, flex roll strengthening. Next slide. You can consult ICRI guideline number uh, 310 for acceptable methods to achieve the desired surface profile. One of the most used ones for vertical and overhead applications is sandblasting to uh, CSP3. As you can see in the pictures in your right, uh, sandblasted concrete showed open pores and made many cracks evident. Next slide. If the FRP fabric is to wrap around any corners, a smooth transition must be created and provided to avoid concentration of stress. The minimum radius accepted is a three quarter inch, so about 19 to 20 millimeters, but the design engineer may have to increase the radius for heavier fabrics such as the uh, 1200 grams per square meter. Next slide. Due to thermal and or structural movement, existing cracks uh, may open and close over time, which may cause buckling of uh, our FRP system. So all cracks greater than uh, 0.3 millimeters, so around 10 mils, uh, must be epoxy injected. Next slide. The cracks could be either injected under pressure or filled with epoxy by gra gravity feed, as we can see in the picture in your right. Next slide. The FRP system must only be installed under the appropriate environmental conditions. So first, ensure that the expect, expected temperature range falls within the acceptable installation tolerance for each epoxy component. Uh, typically, the range is for between 5 to 32 uh, Celsius degrees, so between 40 to 90 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, second, the FRP system must be installed on a dry substrate. So uh, be sure that the surface pores of the substrate are not saturated with uh, water or moisture prior to installation. Uh, for that, you can measure the, the moisture content uh, using ASTM F2659. Uh, uh, if the uh, result is uh, under 4%, you're good to go. If it's uh, above 4%, you have to consult the manufacturer or uh, try to work something with the engineer of record to, uh, to fix that. Uh, you also have to identify and address any source of potential leaks that could allow the accumulation of moisture behind the installed FRP system, as this may lead to delaminations or blistering. Also note that the temperature of substrate must be superior to the dew point by three Celsius degrees. Uh, this step is actually a critical checkup to do, especially for uh, exterior applications. Next, uh, next slide. Now let's go through application steps of FRP systems, starting with FRP fabrics. So the FRP fabric system looks uh, like this. We first have the primer to consolidate and seal the surface of the uh, prepared concrete. Uh, then you can use the epoxy putty to uh, level the surface. And then we have the FRP fabric impregnated with the appropriate saturating epoxy. And then if you want to hide or protect your FRP system, you can send broadcast and apply a top coat or another material on top. Due to the fast-setting nature of the epoxy materials involved in the FRP system, the, the fabric should be prepared prior to uh, mixing the epoxy components. Uh, so the contractor has to cut the strips to the required uh, or designed length and width using a sharp tool. 
Uh, also keep fabric clean of dirt and contaminants and always avoid folding or creasing the fabric. Next slide. When mixing the epoxy components, uh, try always to add the uh, part B to the part A. Mix for at least three minutes using a low speed mixer and use ideally GFI style mixing paddle for most of the epoxies. Next slide. Also select the appropriate tool for each component to apply it. So for example, the primer, which is very fluid, can be applied using a paint roller and the epoxy puri, which is much thicker, will require a trowel or a spatula. Covered rates uh, obviously are provided on each relevant technical data sheet. Next slide. So here is a summary of FRP fabric installation procedure using the dry layup uh, method. We will see another uh, method uh, in a few seconds. So the first step is to apply the primer uh, component. You can, see the, you can see the primer in the brownish zones in the pictures. Second step is to apply the putty component to level all the surface or only irregular surfaces, as you can see in the two pictures. The third step is to apply the first coat of the saturating component, then place the FRP fabric into the steel weight base coat of saturant. After that, you can roll the FRP fabric to remove wrinkles and achieve a tight installation. And finally, apply a second and final top coat of the saturating epoxy component. The wet layup method is slightly different. In the wet layup method, the, the saturating machine is used to pre wet the fabric prior to placement. The purpose is a full impregnation of heavy fabrics fibers using a low viscosity epoxy, but the technique could also be used for regular fabrics. The FRP fabric is actually rolled through a bassin filled with the saturating component and the rollers ensure complete saturation of the fabric while removing excess of uh, epoxy. The pre-wet fabric is then placed on the substrate and rolled uh, tight using drum rollers. Next slide, please. Obviously, the substrate must already have been properly prepared and the primer and putty components must be applied prior to commencing fabric placement using the wet layup method. In this job, the contractor preferred using the wet layup uh, method instead of the dry layup because he felt more protective with the wet layup, even if he had the, the, the choice actually to use the dry layup method. Next slide. If the FRP system is exposed to UV, a top coat must be applied to protect the system. Uh, it may also be required indoors for aesthetical purposes. So the engineer will reinforce his column and the architect will want to uh, hide it with the acrylic paint or uh, something like this. So we can hide the structural uh, intervention. Uh, for that, the contractor has to uh, broadcast sand to refusal into the final top coat application of the saturating component and allow to reach a tack free state before applying the uh, top coat material. Next slide. In this uh, bridge, uh, FRP intervention was protected against UV using a special acrylic coating and the uh, public can barely notice the intervention. Next slide. For the FRP procured laminate installation or the uh, CFRP plates, uh, the surface preparation requirements remain the same as fabric applications. Uh, then we still have to prime the substrate as recommended by the manufacturer. Then remove the peel ply from the side of the laminate to receive the epoxy and apply a uniform layer of the epoxy adhesive to one side of the laminate. Next slide. Also add a layer of epoxy uh, putty on concrete substrate, then press firmly against the substrate to achieve bond using rubber rollers or equivalent hard tool. Next slide. To inspect and check the quality of installation, the most famous tests are a tap test and pull off test. So the tap, tap test is quite simple. Using a hammer, lightly tap the installed FRP system uh, while listening for void spots. Uh, during the training, the manufacturers put a lot of emphasis on avoiding voids for the plates and bubbles for the wraps. For the pull-off testing, a number of pull-off tests can be completed following application of the FRP system. So using the right tool uh, or the right machine, a minimum tensile pull-off strength of 200 PSI, 1.4 MPA, must be achieved to be considered uh, a successful installation. Failure should uh, occur uh, in the concrete for a pass test. 
In the next two slides, uh, we will see two different projects where pull of test was used for bond critical applications. So in the Champlain Bridge, uh, FRP fabrics were uh, used for shear strengthening. Uh, the large amount of fabrics involved in this project obliged the uh, engineers to plan independent and dedicated uh, zones for pull of tests. Next slide. In Place des Arts, downtown Montreal, procured the CFRP laminates were used for uh, flexural strengthening to increase negative resistant moment. In this case, contractor and engineer agreed on installing extra length of some plates uh, compared to their design length and conducted pull-off tests on them. Uh, failure uh, always occurred in concrete and results were, were between 2.8 MPA and 4 MPA, which is about 580 PSI, uh, which is way above the minimum required of uh, 200 PSI or 1.4 MPA. That's it for me. Thank you for your attention. I will leave it to Brian to conclude our presentation. Okay, thanks, Hamza. Yeah, just uh, in, in closing, really, I just wanted to introduce uh, some of the guidelines that are available. So here in the in the US, we use the ACI 440.2R. Uh, that's 2017 is the most most current version of that. Um, then there's a whole host of other uh, 440 documents. Uh, most applicable for, for most of you from um, a design standpoint, uh, really just the material specification, the .8-13, uh, um, but there's documents on um, pre FRP pre-stressing, uh, FRP formwork, uh, all the various tests that uh, need to be run. There's, a, there's all sorts of documents, uh, but the 2R17 is really the main design guide, and then the .8-13 is the material specification. Uh, in Canada, they have the CSA uh, S6 uh, as their bridge code um, that it does include uh, sections on FRP. Uh, and then they have a separate, uh, the S806 is the uh, code for buildings, uh, specifically FRP um, either for, and I believe in Canada, they allow it to be used uh, for new construction as well. Uh, so that document has uh, guidelines for using FRP and new construction and then also repair as well. And then they have the S807, uh, which is their specification for FRP materials. So uh, definitely uh, worth worth your time to grab a, a copy of those documents if, if you're going to be doing any kind of uh, FRP design uh, on your own uh, or with your own firms. Um, so that concludes the uh, AIA portion of the uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to take questions in just a second here, but uh, kind of outside of the AIA, I just wanted to real quickly um, let you know what uh, what we at MAPE are able to provide you uh, as far as FRP uh, support goes. Um, so we do do uh, design calculations uh, either using MathCAD or Microsoft Excel. Um, we can do uh, you know detailing and shop drawings like you see in the, the top picture there is just kind of an example of drawing that you might get um, but we're also available for you know any kind of seminars like we're doing today lunch and learns uh, those types of activities uh, and then applicator trainings as well so most of the specifications will typically require that the you know the contractor has has been uh, you know trained uh, on the system they're installing um, so if, if we are required uh, to provide that training, we're certainly more than happy to do that. Um, we do all this at no charge. Uh, this is just a service we offer. So if, if you have a project and you need some help, uh, you know, getting some, some drawings put together or, or calculating how much material you might need or you just want some help with a specification, whatever it might be, feel free to, uh, you know, call your local uh, MAPE representative and we're, we'll certainly be happy to help you out uh, with that. So. Uh, with that said, um, here's just a, a few additional uh, references. Uh, ACI, obviously, I mentioned uh, ASCE has the Journal of Composites and Construction. Uh, then ICRI has uh, a guide specification for FRP. Uh, they're also, we're currently working on a uh, inspector certification program uh, through ICRI where uh, inspectors, you know, building inspectors can get certified to be a FRP installer. So, it's kind of some of the things we can uh, look forward to seeing here uh, in the near future. Uh, but uh, with that, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, I think uh, Jen uh, is probably going to be reading them to us. Yep, there are a few questions. Um, we're a little bit over time, so we'll take a few and then uh, we'll 
send the rest over to Mape Digital at mape.com. But uh, the first question is, can FRP be used to strengthen heavy timber beams for increased flexural capacity? Um, so uh, the simple answer is yes. Um, the more complicated answer to that is, is kind of a maybe. Um, the kind of the issue with timber, um, while FRP is an acceptable means of strengthening timber beams, there's there's the, the first problem is there's no design guidelines specific to it. Um, so typically we just look at it as, okay, well, we're going to provide this much additional tensile, tensile capacity um, to the material. Um, one of the kind of issues with timber is that it's it's like steel. It's it's more of a balanced situation where you have a equal parts compression and tension. Um, whereas in concrete, that's not the case. You have much much lower tensile capacity from the concrete, and you, you use the steel. So it's 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 a little different with timber, where when you add tensile capacity, you almost have to really match that with the additional compressive. Uh, demand that that's going to place on, on the member. Um, so it gets a little tricky, but um, most of the time, yes, the answer is yes, we can do it. Um, it's just one of those things where we have to look at on an individual project basis um, to just uh, determine if it if it is in fact okay for that part, specific application. Cool. All right. The next one, can FRP cross steel with a one millimeter thick epoxy paste between the two products? Uh, yeah, I think probably a millimeter would be sufficient. You just get, you just gotta make sure that uh, there's zero contact between the FRP and the uh, the steel. Um, the epoxies are not very expensive, so I, I don't, I mean, unless you had an issue where you really had to control the thickness, I wouldn't worry so much about trying to use as little as possible because uh, it's pretty cheap but if you if you do have a, a thickness concern um then yeah i mean one one millimeter should be sufficient as long as it's continuous and there's no exposed steel uh touching the exposed carbon okay good question here's one if a pull test is done and it fails at 2.7 mpa but fails at the epoxy bond to the dolly is this a fail? And if so, why? Yeah, so it's a good question. Actually, we uh, had a situation, uh, I think, in Ontario with my colleagues in Ontario, where uh, <clears throat> the uh, failure always occurred on the uh, in the epoxy glue used to 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 bond the the dollies. And yeah, the engineer accepted the the pull off test because it tested above uh, 1.4 MPA, so it was an acceptable uh, uh, result. Right. Nice. Yep. It's the only thing you're looking for is to exceed the the MPA or two. I, I'm not sure what the MPA version, but it's 200 psi is the minimum for ACI. So yeah, anything over that. Once you get over that, you're passed. It doesn't matter how it fails at that point. They're just looking for that minimum of two, of whatever that minimum is. So beyond that, yes, it is a is considered a passed test. Cool. Okay. Bear with me. This is a long one. When we have a damaged structure i.e. a double T steam in shear, do you provide services to check the existing capacity of that member or an engineer would have to check that for you before uh, hiring you for the strengthening design or application? Right, so uh, we do not provide any engineering services as far as the existing structures. Uh, we're not a consulting engineering firm, and to be honest, we don't even stamp. Uh, while we provide designs for the FRP, we don't stamp them. So we get third-party engineers involved if they need to be stamped. Um, so in the situation described in the question where, where there's some sort of shear issue, yes, a, a consulting engineer would need to be hired to determine uh, what amount of, of strengthening is required. Uh, where we are able to help is then once we know how much shear capacity is required, then we can we can design our system to provide that amount of shear capacity. But we're not able to um, do any analysis of existing structures to determine uh, deficiencies. That that's up to the engineers uh, engineer of record, or if it's just an owner or a contractor, um, then in that case they would have to hire an engineer specifically to do that. 
Yeah, good question. All right. Well, um, as I said before, we are a little bit over time and we don't want to take up everybody's time because we do know it's very precious and we appreciate them uh, listening in today. Uh, if there are any more questions, uh, if, if you're thinking about it during the rest of the day, uh, please send them to mapaydigital at mapay.com and uh, we'll be sure to get them to Brian and Hamza or the appropriate rep. And uh, we really thank you for spending time with us today. Brian, Hamza, thank you for this uh, presentation. It was great. It was really informative. And, um, and we look forward to seeing you guys again. And uh, we'll see everybody at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.